Harvesting Hope, the Story of Cesar Chavez by Kathleen Krull, illustrated by Yuyi, Yuyi Morales. Until Cesar Chavez was 10, every summer night was like a fiesta. Relatives swarmed onto the ranch for barbecues with watermelon, lemonade, and fresh corn. Cesar and his brothers, sisters, cousins settled down to sleep outside under netting to keep mosquitoes out. But who could sleep with uncles and aunts singing, spinning ghost stories, and telling magical tales of life back in Mexico? Caesar thought the whole world belonged to his family. The 80 acres of their ranch were an island in the shimmering Arizona desert, and starry skies were all their own. Many years earlier, Caesar's grandfather had built their spacious adobe house to last forever with walls 18 inches thick. A vegetable garden, cows, and chickens supplied all the food they could want. With hundreds of cousins on the farms nearby, there was always someone to play with. Caesar's best friend was his brother Richard. They never spent a day apart. Caesar was so happy at home that he was a little afraid when school started. On the first day, he grabbed the seat next to his older sister, Rita. The teacher moved him to another seat, and Caesar flew out the door and ran home. It took three days of coaxing for him to return to school and take place with the other first graders. Caesar was stubborn, but he was not a fighter. His mother cautioned her children against fighting, urging them to use their minds and mouths to work out conflicts. Then, in 1937, the summer Caesar was 10, the trees around the ranch began to wilt. The sun baked the farm soil rock hard. A drought was choking the life out of Arizona. Without water for the crops, the Chavez family couldn't make money to pay its bills. There came a day when Caesar's mother couldn't stop crying. In a daze, Caesar watched his father strap their possessions onto the roof of their old car. After a long struggle, the family no longer owned the ranch. They had no choice but to join the hundreds of thousands of people fleeing to the green valleys of California to look for work. Caesar's old life had vanished. Now he and his family were migrants, working on other people's farms, crisscrossing California, picking whatever fruits and vegetables were in season. When the Chavez family arrived at the first of their homes in California, they found a battered old shed. Its doors were missing and garbage covered the dirt floor. Cold, damp air seeped into their bedding and clothes. They shared water and outdoor toilets with a dozen other families, and overcrowding made everything filthy. The neighbors were constantly fighting, and the noise upset Caesar. He had no place to play games with Richard. Meals were some, sometimes made of dandelion greens gathered along the road. Caesar swallowed his bitter homesickness and worked alongside his family. He was small and not very strong, but still a fierce worker. Nearly every crop caused torment. Yanking out beets broke his skin between his thumb and index finger. Grapevines sprayed with bug-killing chemicals made his eyes sting and his lungs wheeze. Lettuce had to be the worst. Thinning lettuce all day with short-handled hoe would make hot spasms shoot through his back. Farm chores on someone else's farm instead of on his own felt like a form of slavery. The Chavez family talked constantly of saving enough money to buy back their ranch. But by each sundown, the whole family had earned as little as 30 cents for the day's work. As the years blurred together, they spoke of the ranch less and less. The towns weren't much better than the fields. White trade only, the signs were displayed in many stores and restaurants. None of the 35 schools Caesar attended over the years seemed like a safe place either. Once, after Caesar broke the rule about speaking English at all times, a teacher hung a sign on him that read, I am a clown. I speak Spanish. He came to hate school because of the conflicts, though he liked to learn. Even he considered his eighth grade graduation a miracle. After eighth grade, he dropped out to work in the fields full time. His lack of schooling embarrassed Caesar for the rest of his life. 
But as a teenager, he just wanted to put food on his family's table. As he worked, it disturbed him that the landowners treated their workers more like farm tools than human beings. They provided no clean drinking water, rest periods, or access to bathrooms. Anyone who complained was fired, beaten up, or sometimes even murdered. So like other migrant workers, Caesar was afraid and suspicious whenever outsiders showed up to try to help. How could they know about feelings so powerless? How could, who could battle such odds? Yet Caesar had never forgotten his old life in Arizona and the jolt he'd felt when it was turned upside down. Farm work did not have to be mi this miserable. Reluctantly, he started paying attention to the outsiders. He began to think that maybe there was hope and in his early 20s, he decided to dedicate the rest of his life to fighting for change. Again, he crisscrossed California, this time to talk people into joining his fight. At first, out of every hundred workers he talked to, perhaps one would agree with him. One by one, this was how he started. At the first meeting Caesar organized, a dozen women gathered. He sat quietly in a corner. After 20 minutes, everyone started wondering when the organizer would show up. Caesar, Caesar thought he might die of embarrassment. Well, I'm the organizer, he said, and forced himself to keep talking, hoping to inspire respect with his new suit and mustache he was trying to grow. The women listened politely, and he was sure they did it out of pity. But despite his shyness, Caesar showed a knack for solving problems. People trusted him. With workers, he was endlessly patient and compassionate. With landowners, he was stubborn, demanding, and single-minded. He was learning to be a fighter. In a fight for justice, he told everyone truth was a better weapon than violence. Nonviolence, he said, takes more guts. It means using imagination to find ways to overcome powerlessness. More and more people listened. One night, 150 people poured into an abandoned theater in Fresno. At his first meeting of the National Farm Workers Association, Caesar unveiled its flag. A bold black eagle, the sacred bird of the Aztec Indians, La Causa, the cause, was born. It was time to rebel, and the place was Delano. Here, in the heart of the lush San Joaquin Valley, brilliant green vineyards reached toward every horizon. Poorly paid workers hunched over grapevines for most of each year. Then, in 1965, the vineyards owners cut their pay even further. Caesar chose to fight just one of the 40 landowners, hopeful that others would get the message. As plump grapes drooped, thousands of workers walked off that company's fields in a strike, or wegla. Grapes, when ripe, do not last long. The company fought back with everything from punches to bullets. Caesar refused to respond with violence. Violence would only hurt La Casa. Instead, he organized a march, a march of more than 300 miles. He and his supporters would walk from Delano to the state capital in Sacramento to ask for the government's help. Caesar and 67 others started out one morning. Their first obstacle was the Delano police, police force. 30 of whose members locked arms to prevent the group from crossing the street. After three hours of arguing in public, the chief of police backed down. Joyous marchers headed north under the sizzling sun. Their rallying cry was, Si se puedo, or yes, it can be done. The first night they reached Decor, the marchers slept outside the tiny cabin of the only person who would welcome them. Single file, they continued, covering an average of 15 miles a day. They inched their way through the San Joaquin Valley, while the unharvested grapes in Delano turned white with mold. Caesar developed painful blisters right away. He and many others had blood seeping out of their shoes. The word spread. Along the way, farm workers offered food and drink as the marchers passed by. 
When the sun set, marchers lit candles and kept going. Shelter was no longer a problem. Supporters began welcoming them each night with feasts. Every night was a rally. Our pilgrimage is the match, one speaker shouted. That will light our cause for the farm workers to see what is happening here. Another cried, we seek our basic God-given rights as human beings. Viva la casa. Eager supporters would keep their marchers up half the night talking about change. Every morning, the line of marchers swelled, Caesar always in the lead. On the ninth day, hundreds marched through Fresno. The long, peaceful march was a shock to people unaware of how California farm workers had to live. Now students, public officials, religious leaders, and citizens from everywhere offered help. From the grape company, the publicity was becoming unbearable. And on the vines, the grapes continued to rot. In Modesto, the, on, the, on the 15th day, an exhilarated crowd celebrated Caesar's 38th birthday. Two days later, 5,000 people met the marchers in Stockton with flowers, guitars, and accordions. That evening, Caesar received a message that he was sure was a prank. But in case it was true, he left the march and had someone drive him all through the night to a mansion in wealthy Beverly Hills. Officials from the grape company were waiting for him. They were ready to recognize the authority of the National Farm Workers Association, promising a contract with pay raise and better conditions. Caesar rushed back to join the march. On Easter Sunday, when the marchers arrived in Sacramento, the parade was 10 thousand people strong. From the steps of the state capitol building, the joyous announcement was made to the public. Cesar Chavez had just signed the first contract for farm workers in American history. The parade erupted into a giant fiesta. Crowds swarmed the steps. Some people cheering, many weeping. Prancing horses carried men in mariachi outfits. Everyone sang and waved flowers or flags. They, they made a place of honor for the 57 marchers who had walked the entire journey. The speaker after speaker addressing the audience in Spanish and in English took the microphone. You cannot close your eyes and your ears to us any longer, he cried. You cannot pretend that we do not exist. The crowd celebrated until the sky was full of stars. The march had taken its toll. Caesar's leg was swollen and he was running a high fever. Gently, he reminded everyone that the battle was not over. It is well to remember there must be courage, but also that in victory, there must be humility. Much more work lay ahead, but the victory was stunning. Some of the wealthiest people in the country had been forced to recognize some of the poorest as human beings. Cesar Chavez had won his fight without violence, and he would never be powerless again.